Hi, my name is Amy Timmerman, and I'd like to go over a case study that I worked with an organization in implementing ISO 45001. I'd like to start by giving you a little background on myself. As I mentioned, I'm Amy Timmerman. I'm an instructional assistant professor at Illinois State University. I have over 20 years experience working in the environmental health and safety field. I work for some Fortune 500 companies like General Electric and Siemens. I'm currently chair of the Z10 Occupational Health and Safety Management System, and I'm also part of the leadership team to the U.S. TAG for the ISO 45001. And how I started uh, working with this organization it was back in uh, 2018, I got a call. It was a local company. If I could come in and help them kind of analyze looking at their health and safety program. They were looking and going the direction of the management system, but they just wanted a little bit of guidance if they were going down the right uh, road path. Let me give you a little overview of this uh, company. It is an aluminum industry. So they extrude uh, aluminum parts and then they fabricate them towards whatever the customer needs are. They work domestically and, and internationally. They are a privately owned family-owned company. Uh, they've been in the business for over 60 years, and they employ roughly about 400 personnel. And these 400 workers, they actually, they work for the organization. At times throughout the year, they will have temporary employees come in, and that can vary anywhere from 10 additional employee, or temporary employees to maybe 50 additional temporary employees. It just depends on the peaks throughout the, the year. They have two locations and they're roughly about 30 to 40 minutes apart and it's two campuses. So one campus is our main campus and on this they have several uh, buildings, maybe anywhere from like six to eight buildings. And then on the second campus, it's a larger campus. They don't have as many buildings, but the buildings are bigger. And it's roughly divided evenly between the number of employees on, on each campus. The other thing about this organization is they've had a lot of just organic growth year after year. And that's just amazing to see. And they've taken a lot of that, the growth they've had and reinvested it back into the organization. So they've reinvested, uh, taking out older equipment, putting in newer equipment. With all their expansion, they added additional uh, lines on the production floor. So they have definitely reinv reinvested back into the organization. So when I ca came into the organization, the leadership shared with me a couple, some of the health and safety issues, and then I uncovered some other health and safety issues as I was uh, learning more about the organization. Some additional health and safety issues was one, when I was looking at these injuries that they were showing me, going through their incident investigation reports, they were very incomplete or inadequate. What I saw is they were not identifying the root causes. So when you don't get to the root cause of an incident, what you're going to see is eventually down the road, it's going to, you're going to, it's going to happen again, whether it's a week later, six months later, a year later you're gonna have a reoccurrence. And that's what I saw as a common theme in their incidents where because they were not identifying the root causes, and some of them, when they would identify some of these causes, there wasn't a follow through or there wasn't accountability on making sure that they were closing these action items. So their incident management program needed some assistance. It needed a revamp. They weren't doing good investigations. They weren't identifying these root causes. So they were in this vicious cycle of the incident happens, they don't get the root causes identified, and then they're six months later, it's something, it's the same thing's happening again, and it's just going in a, a circle here. So that was one of their issues, was their incident management program just needed some revamping. The other thing is, there was just a lack of not understanding what their, their hazards and their risks of their hazards were. They had all these different departments, but they weren't identifying the hazards. And some of this came to also competency, where some of the workers, you know, they didn't have the training or the competency to identify what the hazards were. They weren't assessing the risks of these hazards, determining whether were they a high risk, a medium risk, or a low risk. Because if they're a high risk, you know, we want to make sure that we're getting controls put in place. And that was another thing. Some of the controls they put in place were not 
adequate to reduce that risk down to that medium and low level that they needed to get to. So there was a lack of understanding of what the hazards were, how to assess the risk. Uh, there wasn't a good methodology put into place on assessing that risk and what category it was in. And then the controls in place, not choosing you know, the right control. Sometimes you know, the less costly control isn't always gonna be the most effective control. So making sure they identify those correct control. A lot of times you need layers of controls too. You know, you can't just have one control, it's several layers of control. So that was another health and safety big issue. The other thing was in this organization, they did not have clear roles and responsibilities, okay? When you don't have clear roles and responsibilities, you can have some chaos, okay? Nobody knows what they're doing, and that can lead to frustration. And I saw that out on the floor where there was individuals just frustrated because certain things weren't getting done. Well, nobody really had a clear idea what their roles and responsibilities were in health and safety. So, you know, you get this frustration, and then it can lead to just some negativity, let's get into, you know, the culture. So that was another thing they needed to take a look at is getting these clear roles and responsibilities spelled out uh, for all the workers. In this organization also, they had an EHS manager, but that EHS manager also wore a dual hat of a maintenance manager. And so we all know it's a lot of work being an EHS manager, to be, but to add on that role of a maintenance manager, that dual tasking was weighing on that individual. You know, they're being stretched too thin trying to do the health and safety and trying to do the maintenance at the same time. So that was another issue is where they couldn't give their time and attention and provide that technical expertise to the leadership team on health and safety because they were doing dual roles. So that was another issue we saw going on. And then performance evaluation. There wasn't a good visibility on how the health and safety was doing. There wasn't dashboards, key performance indicators. They didn't have, they weren't doing in inspections and audits to see, you know, how are we doing? Where do we need to put our time and resources are? Um, not, they didn't have objectives established to see, you know, how we're doing and taking a look at them. Are we meeting our goals? So those are some other types of issues that they had going on at this organization. So I'd like to talk a little bit of how they came to health and safety management system and, and putting it into place. So, you know, with all these health and safety issues they had, they, they knew they needed to make a change. They had to enhance their health and safety programs. A lot of it was piecemeal together. They didn't have good processes and systems into place. And they also wanted to ensure that they were in compliance. So they knew that they needed to do a makeover with their health and safety program. Uh, they just weren't sure, you know, what do we need to do? How are we going to get there? So one of the things that was unique with this organization is, you know, they had a background already on ISO 9001. So they had a good system in place for their quality management system. And at the time, they were looking to enhance their health and safety. It just happened to be in 2018, and that's the time when ISO 45001 was coming out in March of, of 2018. And when they were looking at their ISO 9001, they thought, you know what, they saw the light of their quality system turning around when they implemented 9001. And they saw how that got them to where they needed to be nowadays for their quality program. They were looking for the same thing for the health and safety. You know, we need to get to that next level. And seeing how the ISO 9001 got them there, they're like, maybe this ISO 45001 can get us to where we need to go. They were looking at other management systems at the time. Uh, Z10 was the other one that they knew about and they were looking at that. But the one key difference between them that the management the top leadership wanted was they wanted that third-party certification. And that was really, truly important to them to get that certification. They wanted to be able to, you know, communicate that out to their customers, their suppliers, that, hey, we got this, this ISO 45001 certification. So that was one of probably the main uh, the drivers that leaned them towards the ISO 45001 is they were looking for that third-party certification. 
And they also already kind of knew that ISO language from 9001. Now, for any of you that are familiar with 9001 and looking at 45001, the beauty of 45001 is, you know, 50% of that language has already been set. So in all these ISO standards, 50% of that language is the same from one management system to another. So it makes it a little bit easier going from one management system to the next one because the language is all the same. Okay, so you can easily, I shouldn't say easily, but you can, you can streamline that other 50% into the already systems that you have in place in your other management systems. So that's kind of the beauty of this, this Annex SL language that you see in these ISO standards. And you can see on this slide here, if you go in 45001, there's a section point three, and it has the success factors. And these are all the key factors that you really need to have in place in order to achieve that high level 45001 implementation. What we did here is I took those key factors and put them into questions here. And this is a worksheet here that had the top leadership sit down and go through. And we also had middle management go through it, supervisors, and then you know, workers on the production floor. Each took the time to fill out this survey here and ask, you know, where are we at? How do you feel we are with um, you know, management commitment? How do we feel about our resources? What about our communication? What about our performance evaluation? And on a scale of one to five, I asked them, you know, where are you in your organization for management commitment? One being low, five being high. And this is this was a really eye-opener, and I think anybody that does this exercise will find this as an aha moment. Because you may have individuals that think, yeah, we're doing great on our commitment. We're at, a, we're at a four to five. And then you see the next person next to you, when they do it, they're looking at it as, as at a one. So this really opens the discussion, well, why the difference? You know, why do you see it as a four and I see it as a one? And this really can get in some good, deep conversation within your organization is how you're seeing things differently. So it's a good launching pad to see, you know, where are you at, you know, from your top leadership, middle management workers, and where do you need to go? And I highly recommend as you go through this implementation of 45001, is come back to this exercise, you know, throughout it, halfway through your point, you know, do it again to see how are you doing? Are you improving? So it's a good gauge. How are we going along on this journey? Are we improving? Are we making, hitting our goals and objectives that we want to? So I highly recommend using this as an, an exercise. And I found that this organization really has success in, in going through this, this exercise and seeing really where they're at and where they want to be. As I started along on this journey, we went through this exercise. We did a gap analysis then. We went through all of their programs, all of their different processes and systems in place, and we identified all the different gaps. And we categorized all of those gaps of things that we needed to you know, fill in the blanks with, and then also areas that they were weak in, and we needed to strengthen those. Same time, we were also identifying areas since they had the quality management system in place, and that was humming. They've had that for over 10 years, and they had a really good you know, quality management system in place. We looked at where are the areas for health and safety that we can start to integrate this into already the systems that were put in place with a quality management system? You know, for example, they had a quality management system manual. Well, what they ended up doing is they combined that into a quality health and safety. The last thing we want to do, you know, is have these silos, quality, health and safety, you know, HR, you know, purchasing. What we want is, you know, one harmonizing all these business functions harmonizing together. So that's why they decide, you know, to, to combine to one manual quality, health and safety. Another example is, you know, when they were looking at internal and external issues, you know, they looked at it from a holistic standpoint, from a quality side, but also a health and safety side. They had good documentation information already system in place. They had level one procedures, two procedures. Well, that was fantastic because as they were creating the health and safety programs and procedures, we we're able to just tag off that already, that document information system that they had in place. The other thing too is their corrective actions. They had a process in place already, a system, software system for corrective actions, for quality 
And we said, well, why don't we, we already know we don't have a tracking system for corrective actions for our incident investigations, for our compliance inspections. We get these corrective actions and they just kind of, they fall into a spreadsheet and they fall off our plate. There's no accountability. So what the organization did is they took their software system for quality and we added in a health and safety piece of it. So as now, as we were doing incident investigation, corrective actions, we had specs in the software system, everything was tracked in the system and it was a closed loop system. You put the corrective actions in there, the root causes, it got signed out to supervisors, managers, whoever, there was due dates and there was follow up and it was also on the dashboard to make sure that these corrective actions were happening. Some of the other things that we integrated in with the quality system, they had great communication processes put in for quality. Management review, so they had a good system in place for management review from quality. We added in the health and safety. So I'm hoping that you can envision, you know, for those of you that have the ISO 9001, you already have these systems in place. We're not starting from scratch here. What we're doing is we're just tag teaming off the management system for quality and layering then that health and safety piece. Uh, the other big one is, you know, management of change. We all know, gosh, we all know, you know, management of change is always a challenge, really for any organization. And so what they did is they had a management of change in place for the quality system and what we started to do is layer in that health and safety. So as new equipment would come in, there was specs now for health and safety that EHS manager got to sign off on it. Uh, but it's not just equipment. We know there's been a change with personnel changes, technology changes. So we started to layer in all the health and safety. So we weren't starting from scratch here. What we were doing is integrated into the systems that were already there. So it's a living, breathing system. And it's all functioning and harmonizing as one here. The last thing too with the integration for quality is they had a procurement process for supplier pre-qualification. And we, we know with the contractors for ISO 45001, there's a whole section on contractors. What we did is we took that pre-qualification for suppliers and we started to add in a contractor piece pre-qualification. So again, we weren't starting from scratch here. We were just adding in specs for contractors. So when they would come in, we would have a pre-qualification form that they would have to fill out. And that met one of the requirements for 45,001, having some type of criteria for your contractors. I'd like to give you a timeline for this project, just to put it in perspective for you. So in September of 2018, that was when the project was approved. I started coming into the organization in August of 2018 and we were talking about the project. I was kind of giving them guidance on 45,001. That's when we were going the, the, through the success factors workshop. In September of 2018, that's when we really, we launched the project. That following month, we started working on those health and safety programs where all those gaps we identified, we started working on those as a team, cross-functional teams. We start to identify uh, an incident management software program in November because that's one of the things they had uh, an issue with with their incident investigation also is that everything was manual. So it was put on a paper, on a spreadsheet, and it would kind of just fall off. It would disappear. And by implementing a system, a software system, they put a cross-functional team together to identify an incident management software program out there. They started to do a search. This way that they could better manage their incidents, their costs of their incidents, and show their savings for the incidents. So they put together that team in November. In February, they started to put the specs together for the corrective action for health and safety into that quality management corrective action software system they had. In March, they did all their training on the incident investigations, the software program that they implemented. So they had company-wide training from the supervisors to the workers, getting that uh, rolled out to everyone. And then again, while all this is going on, there's a lot of background stuff that's happening. All these health and safety programs are being uh, revamped and worked on along the way. And then in April, we, we had the goal of April for this third party to come out and do a pre-approval to take a look at, okay, where are we at now? Because our certification was set for August of 2019. And the reason they chose that is 
That is when their ISO 9001 recertification was coming up, and they wanted to combine that with 45001 at that time. So in April, we had the third party come out and take a look at how are we doing? Are we on track to meet that August certification? The third party came out. They spent four days with myself and the organization. They were going through everything. They gave us the green light. They said, this, you guys, your organization is doing great. You're on track. We see that you'll be ready to go in August. So I'd like to share with you some of the benefits uh, this organization um, saw from implementing ISO 45001. And one of the main ones was a reduction of injuries. They saw a 50% reduction of their injuries throughout this journey, which is huge. So, you know, some of their injuries that they've had were getting into the six figures. Well, even with reducing their injuries down, the injuries they've had now, they're not these high severity injuries. So instead of you know, a six-figure injury, maybe the injury is only costing them, you know, five, eight thousand dollars in the, in that range. So that's good. You know, they're not having as severe injuries. And one of that can tie back to is when they were identifying all their hazards and assessing those risks, they started to put in these controls in place. And they by prioritizing it, they were identifying these high risk hazards out there, putting the controls in place. So they were reducing them down from a high level risk down to a medium, even to a low level risk. So that had a significant impact on their organization by reducing these, these risks that they've identified with these hazards. Uh, the other benefit is, you know, I talked about earlier their INSA investigation program. It was just incomplete. Uh, they weren't identifying these root causes. So then they were having these injuries happen six months again a year later. And by implementing this management system, they really got a good comprehensive incident management program put in place. They are now having consistent investigations. They are identifying these root causes. And besides identifying the root causes, now, you know, they're tracking them. Everyone's held accountable. So when they get these root causes, they're put into this software system. They're tracked. They're assigned somebody to somebody to fix. They have due dates. And also, they got the visibility of leadership looking at these. So they're looking at them on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, saying, okay, where are we at? So by putting these solutions in place, you know, they're not having a repeat of these injuries happening. And the other thing is they're able to do these data analytics now. So by having this information in a software program, they can slice and dice the data and be proactive, saying, okay, we're seeing a trend over here. We need to put our attention and resources on this. Another benefit was the visibility of health and safety performance. Prior, you know, they didn't have any dashboards or KPIs. So part of this process, we identified leading and leading indicators for top leadership to be looking at. So now they have a, a dashboard that they're looking at a weekly basis, and then they can look at a monthly basis. So we have these different dashboards now where leadership can take a look at. How are we doing? Uh, do we need to make a change over here? Maybe we need some resources over here. What are the challenges we have? So that's been a huge thing is just this uh, visibility with a health and safety performance. Um, and the, also in the management review, you know, every six months they have a management review. So they're t taking a look at the high level action items. They're looking at the corrective actions from the inspections, the audits, you know, what percent are complete. Why aren't maybe these being completed? What challenges, what resources do we need? So that's another benefit is just the visibility of health and safety. And probably maybe more passionate from my standpoint is the worker participation. That was just totally changed around through this management system. I mean, it was there, but it just was taken to another level. Now you see these workers where they feel empowered. They're owners of the health and safety program now. You know, they're not just being told what to do. They're empowered to make these decisions. It's their program. There's a lot more involvement where you have workers that are participating in the incident investigations, the inspections. And I also have to say, you know, one of the open items they had was they didn't have an environmental health and safety policy. 
And so they had a lot of worker participation in the development of this environmental health and safety policy. It took a lot of time, but they were consulting workers all along the way. So I, I'm very excited to just see how much worker participation and the ownership and the empowerment these workers have now. Some of the other things is continuous improvement. So now they got it, since they have a good systems in place, you see this continuous improvement year after year. It's not just staying at, you know, how can we do better? What's a better opportunity? And they just keep reinvesting in themselves and in their health and safety program.